Good evening. First, let me welcome all of you to this uh, second seminar offered by the JSW School of Public Policy. Now, as you know, this is a very young, perhaps the youngest entity in the institute. Still getting established. And this was one of the activities that we started last November. Now, just to tell you very briefly about the school, for the first year or so, that is at least till the middle or the end of 2019, we see the school as a platform. We are visualizing this as a platform open to all faculty members of the institute who are working on public policy issues. So, by the time the infrastructure comes up, it's going to be another year and a half. So that is the time when we really go see something like a building for the JSW School of Public Policy. But up to that point of time, we have initiated a series of case writing projects in collaboration with the Lal Bhadu Shastri National Academy of Administration, Musumi. We have also initiated some case writing activities on our own. We have some research projects which have been floated and faculty members of the IA are involved in those research projects as well. The seminar series is the third activity and in addition we have the co-branded executive education program series that is starting sometime in February, March this year. So this is a broad range of activities so I am very happy to welcome Dr. Kuntala Lahiridat to deliver this, who very kindly agreed to deliver this second talk in the series. Also thanks to Professor Vegard for getting hold of her and bringing her here. He was instrumental last time as well in organizing the first talk. So this is the second and perhaps the third also. We are just putting some pressure on him. So the third talk is also going to be organized by Vegard. Now Dr. Lenny's that's background is you must have gone through it. Let me just quickly recap the highlights. Professor Resource Development and Environment Program at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU. What uh, struck me was the, the interface of gender, environment, and natural resource management. That is something which, in the first time I saw this writer, that struck me a lot. And uh, the title of the forthcoming book is also very interesting, Extractive Peasants. If I understood, that's the title of the book that is under preparation. And this appealed to me because this goes back 30 years when I was looking at artisanal mining, informal small-scale mining in the tribal belts of Western India. So this struck an immediate chord and I'm really interested in seeing what that book is going to have. That is one book. The second book is also very interesting in title between the plough and the pig, informal, artisanal and small-scale mining in the contemporary world. So these are fascinating topics. Informal, small-scale, artisanal, tribal mining is something that you normally don't read about in, except when there are some violent flare-ups. That is the time when you really come to realize that this is actually a very important part of our daily lives for many, many people. So it's an honor to welcome you, Kodala. So please, let's listen to you. If there are any questions, would you like to take them as we go along or yes. at the end of your talk? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction, wonderful. Uh, I would like uh, to take uh, questions as we go along. Uh, I'm really pleased that all of you have come today here. And uh, I think uh, let us keep it informal, as informal as we can. And uh, if there is a question, just stop me and ask me. Or if I go too fast, if you don't understand something that I have said, if you need a clarification, please let me know. Then, uh, that way it's much better, rather than just me talking <coughs> about, you know, at a stretch and, and, and tie my throat. 
All right. Uh, the title you can see. What I have decided to do is that there's a lot of theory in the abstract that I wrote, and I know that um, the custom in a conference or a, or a seminar is to, in a presentation, is to provide the theoretical background first and then go into the empirical material. But I have been doing this research for a long time. And there are two ways, as you would all know, there are two ways to get to the theory. Either you read the theory and then go to the field and to match your empirical evidence with the theory, or you, you do extensive empirical work and then the theory comes to you. Uh, and, and I think this is what happened to me in my case. And I have been, my early research, early papers, you could see that I have been touching, you know, I'm trying to make sense of what I'm, what I'm doing, but I wasn't really getting there. And I think uh, that's the reason why I think I feel uh, poised to write a book on extractive prisons, you know, the topic that I'm going to talk about. What basically I'm talking about is that in India, there's, you know, think about the mining debates. The people imagine these big, bad mining corporations uh, and, and the innocent, idyllic, uh, village communities, and, and they are all victims, you know, suffering from this oppression and exploitation and the, you know, unthinking behavior by the mining corporations. I just want to complicate this binary view a little bit. And, and, and any literature on mining in India is just based on this binary notion, this view that these are the two uh, protagonists in, in this debate. What I'm trying to say is that it, Reality is a lot more complex, a lot more complicated than just, just that simplicity. And when poor people do mining themselves, under what circumstances do they do? What's happening? What's going on actually? We need to know that. And that's, that's where I'm coming from here. So start with coal, because that's my big area of research. But I've done a little bit of gemstones and diamonds and gold and other things as well. Coal is, is really my topic close to my heart. In India, coal is not just a material, it's not just a fossil fuel, it's, it's not just a thing to be extracted. It is, in India, you know, we, we feel that coal is a, a national asset and that was written uh, by the Coal Fields Committee as early as 1931, you know. So there's all this view about coal as a, as a material for nation building. We need it for power generation. We need it to sustain India, in, you know, to, to achieve the 7.5% economic growth that we aspire for next year or, or, or years after. So they, these are the things. The activists, on the one hand, they are saying that coal is a, they look at coal as a weapon of land grab, you know, and something that supersedes cause community rights. But then there are also scholarly views that you look at indigenous people as traditional, you know. The traditional coal cutters in the early days of uh, mining, when colonial mining, local ind indigenous people came to the colonies to work as coal. Myers, so Kulis and Cummings, these stories. But there are scholars like you know, Polani and following Polani's view, uh, Shalini Radhira's work, if you, you know, who describes it as a cutting state, she, she, they, they talk about how a material like coal transforms the developmental state into a land broker state. So these are things to remember that coal is really much more than just a material for India. In, and this picture is actually from Margaret Reed's book on uh, coal mining in India and showing how indigenous women uh, joined Kuliaris as Kamins, you know, they emerging from the shallow coal mines of Kuria Khas in those days. I have done a lot of research trying to understand nowhere in the world, even at the peak of industrial, no, only during the peak of industrial revolution in the UK, there was a Ministry of Coal. Elsewhere, nowhere in the world, there is a Ministry of Coal. Separate Ministry of Coal is a symbol. You know, it actually just makes the, you know, analyze the point that I have just made. 
that coal is not just a material for India, it's of national importance. And if you dig through coal, the layers of law that are surrounding coal, you would be fascinated. Let's look at these two very important, oops, sorry, I have been given a, a button to press. Generation. Again, there is a sense of nation building 
they are there. There is a need for energy, there is a need for power in the country, and that's why we are mining coal. And that's why we are allowing private operators to come into existence. So that's the neoliberal coal. As you know that many of the old collieries were shut down, the underground mines were shut down, and most of these, open, uh, these new privately owned mines are open cut collieries, which have a large ecological footprint. <coughs> many old collieries, the underground collieries, when they were shut, the workers were given voluntary retirement, and as a result, the coal prices have also risen as a result of the deregulation of coal prices. Coal prices in India are still a lot lower than the global coal prices, but they have risen. It's important because that's one of the things that are attracting the peasants to coal mining as well. So let's look at the third coal economy. I call it subsistence coal. Initially I was thinking of survival coal, but it's not entirely a survival coal because there are, you know, there are middle men involved, there are intermediaries involved in the marketing of that. What is happening in, uh, in, a, in a place like Jharkhand, for example? Jharkhand is the new resource frontier within India. It's the resource periphery. And all collieries that were opened in Raniganj, Bokaro area in southern Jharkhand, they hired the local indigenous people to work in these collieries as laborers, as workers. Most of these collieries were underground collieries. But the new collieries that are coming up in Jharkhand, also in central India, in uh, Odisha, these are the large open cut collieries which are changing the local political economy considerably. Agrarian, you know, there is a decay in peasantry happening, agrarian change is taking place, people are leaving agriculture, people are displaced from their traditional occupations and they are leaving agriculture and looking for other occupations. So what will they do? When a, an indigenous family is displaced from their traditional occupations, when the forests are cut, they are taking up coal mining as their subsistence activity. You would say that this is impossible because Jharkhand, you know, in this uh, area in Jharkhand, Jharkhand was created in 2000 as you know as a response to indigenous, uh, you know, as a response to the movements by indigenous people to give them the rights. So there is Chotunagpur, CNTA, Chotunagpur Tribal Areas Act, which prevents alienation of tribal land. Or also there is PESA, you know, which prevents the transferring of uh, tribal land in Chotunagpur area. But then CBAA acts as a major instrument. We have Coal Bearing Areas Act that comes in handy to uh, supersede these community rights that have been given in Indian law to take over. So what is happening is CBAA is being used to take, and I have written about these things in EPW as you know. There is also the issue of Gair Majurwa land, some land that is without deed. The Gair means without Majurwa, there is no deed. These Lands have been traditionally <coughs> used by indigenous communities for generations. So these land, when the in, when the mining company takes wants to take up that land, it becomes quite easy. All you need is to call the police or the armed forces to evict the people out of those lands. So what we are seeing is it's a kind of incremental land grab that's happening in Jharkhand, <coughs> which is you know described as new enclosures, the foreignization of space. So when, interesting thing is that when the indigenous person who used to be dependent on the forest resources is now taking up coal mining, you know, pushing it in a bicycle, I'll show you some pictures right now. 
then you can say that there is a moral issue involved, right? So with the new enclosures and the fertilization of space, it is a moral claim. It's, it's a moral economy they have created. So if we say national goal inhabits the resource nationalism domain, and neoliberal goal, they privately mine, they in, in, inhabits the neoliberal political economic domain, we can say that this inhabits the moral domain, you know, this type of mining. In, but then there is a fourth one as well. Oh, I have, before I go into the fourth one, I will just explain this subsistence type goal a little bit. Now, there is a difference between illegal, illegal coal and illegal mining. Perfectly legally mined coal can become illegal. If, how? Because lawfully mined coal, if it is damaged from coal dams, you know, and open cars, it, it, if it falls off the trucks or water, it can become illegal. And then open, abandoned, old abandoned <coughs> mines can be broken open, and you can go in, take the pillars, you can cut the pillars that are been left by the mining company, and all that. Very interesting thing I found is that in resource nationalism regime, in national coal regime, the coal distribution system was also quite controlled centrally. So the government thought that, okay, this is, we are producing coal for national development, right? So how we need to control the distribution of the coal as well. How will we do that? We will link coal with local industries. So all the local industries like sponge iron plants or brick kilns were given a cheat called linkage. And now those companies or this, those factories may have, may have gone out of business a long time ago and new ones have come. These cheats were issued in late 70s, 80s, but they have multiplied in number. And the trucks, they, they just carry the coal with those cheats. So distribution system is a very complicated thing. If you go to the coal producing areas, the entire domestic uh, sector uses coal, but there is no do domestic distribution of coal in that area. So how do they get coal? You can easily imagine it's all problematic there. And then there are unlicensed coal mines or privately owned lands, then there are unrecorded coal areas. When Coal India Limited was established in 19, early 1970s, a few colleagues just, you know, fell off the list. They forgot to enlist those. So they remain as colleagues, but they have now become illegitimized because they don't exist, technically. And then there are old abandoned mines as well, which have been reopened. But I've come back to the four types. Yes? You said four types, but what about the import of coal that is taking place? It also has implications for these four types as well as you know, environment. Absolutely. Yeah. It has and GSW is one of the major. Coal import is for the coastal power plants, you know, mm. along the peninsula. India, that's coastal power plants, plants and resource. Actually, at the moment, I'm looking into resource internationalism. Yeah. So, coal videsh that Coal India Limited had started. And it has implications not for the coal mining industry within India. It has implications for energy policy within India. Importation of coal, you know how, and also it has in, in implications for the behavior of Indian owned SOEs or private companies like the Adani's or Coal India Limited or Tata Power Company that have invested in other countries in coal mining. So how do they follow the global norms you know, the, the principles that have been laid by ICMM or the country's CSR norms and all that sort of thing. That would not be a part of the coal economy and such. It would be part of the energy economy of the country. Because India knows that India's dependence on coal is not going to go away, no matter how many solar panels we uh, put in, no, ma no matter how many wind turbines we put in, no matter how many dams we put in, we are dependent on them and we will remain dependent on coal at least for the next 30, 40 years, if not longer. So we are producing coal for internal generation and then there, there is nationally 
we are doing it nationally and then under the umbrella of the national and neoliberal goal there are these subsistence goals but there is also the imported goal that is feeding the coastal flower power plants and producing energy. But do we require to import because you are saying that you said that the global prices are higher than the Indian price. So why are we doing? Why are we not? Why are we importing? Because if the global prices are higher, the Indian prices are lower. Yeah, Indian prices are still lower. We are importing because our coal is not perfect in quality. Okay. That's one reason. It is not usable in, in steel mills. That's another reason. You know, it, it is good for power generation. That too, it really clogs up the power plants, chimneys and all that with high ash content. That's another reason. And <coughs> The demand is such, the internal demand for energy is such from the growing urban industrial India that we are in, we are having to import. Okay, so that's the <coughs> that's the reason. I'll, I'll move on to the fourth type of economy now. Oh, I haven't put it here. That's great. So this is describing the about uh, 60 truck full of coals go between uh, you know the coal that has been taken. Young boys, young kids go climb up the wagons that are carrying national coal and they throw it. And so the tracks are strewn with coal and then the trucks would come in the evening and carry all the coal away. And just, this is on, on a common land, a big open cut mine, but community type of mining. This is an old, this is an operating open cut mine. It had a very narrow coal seam on the top. The government went for the lower thick coal seam. The local people started to take the narrow seam out. And transportation is by uh, these carts. This woman is doing it. Fill the sack. This is on a leasehold land in uh, near, in, in one, I won't give you the name of the place in Jharkhand. Okay, and then they push the cycle. It's a family affair. Very very semi-feudal or pre-modern type of production system you would see in this. But <laughs> there is a fourth coal economy here and that I call statecraft coal because I talked so far about in a, in a binary way, didn't I? I talked about the mining companies, they could be either SOEs, like CIL, or they could be private, huh? like the neoliberal, you know, the coal mines. <coughs> And then there are these subsistence coal operators. But then I go to Meghala and what do I see? I see a fascinating story. I was driving from Guwahati to Barapani and to see these mines and there was a truck burning 30 feet away from me and truck drivers, thousands of truck drivers blocked up the road protesting against a ban by the National Green Tribunal to stop coal mining. So these truck drivers were expending out more or less the feeling that was being felt by the local indigenous people in Meghalaya, the Khasis. Okay? So why was this? But when the government wanted to open uranium coal mining, or uranium coal mines in Meghalaya, these very classes objected. They did not allow the government to open the uranium mine. So there's something happening there. They have been mining coal for a long time, you know, 100 years. And these shallow, well-type, you know, narrow, shallow, well-type coals have been in operation. You know, Bangladeshis, Nepali workers work, and you sometimes would see sensationalistic stories, both about subsistence coal and statecraft coal. I call it statecraft coal because it was a very clever statecraft measure that brought Meghalaya within Indian nation. <coughs> Meghalaya state was given a special status, sixth scheduled status in Indian constitution that gives the right to the local people of the resources that lie under their land. Very unusual in India. But at the same time, what did I say? MCDR and MMDR coal is a major mineral that can be cut only by big companies. So we have a 
compass here, we have a strange situation here. That coal can be done by big companies only, but these people have been doing it for a long time and they have the right to do it. And the government wants to stop it by taking the environment route, right? But they won't stop it. They won't let the government stop it. That's why I call it statecraft goal. You can read all this. This is all written and I think in large enough font. And the government has been trying to stop this type of mining for the last 20 years or more and failed miserably. And all the media reports are quite uncomplimentary about this type of mining. You know, but <coughs> how do I describe this type of mining then? Do I call it illegal? Technically it is. But we cannot call it. Politically it is not. Because the people have the right, so I call it non-legal. It's neither legal nor illegal. It's non-legal. It's more falling through a crack in the our laws, the layers of law that we have created around coal, which is the material, right? So I have I went down through in in a bucket, iron bucket, into one of these just to see. It was a pleasant experience. As the bucket went down, the light went out and it became dark and very humid and then it, there's hardly enough space. You know, I had to squat and go and I, I felt a little scared after going about, you know, 20 meters inside and then I came back, decided to come back and I have had enough. But this is the condition in which some of them are quite big and have these sorts of steps. So now let me bring a little bit of political economy into this descriptive this account of four polar economies, right? So now we can easily see, and you know formal, informal, you know, sort of uh, division within India's economy. Barbara Harris White says that is 83% of India's economy is in, in the informal sector, right? If we include, if we include uh, the, uh, the agriculture sector. So we can see that, okay, there are two, uh, you know, coal economies which are formal. Uh, national coal, we can say it's formal. Neoliberal coal, we can say it's, uh, it, it's also formal. Informal is uh, uh, survival coal or subsistence coal and also the Mikhala is the statecraft coal, right? In India, informality is the defining condition with which we, you know, the poor, for example, the domestic labor that is working in your house or the driver who brought you, of your car, who brought you here today, they are all part of this informal sector. <coughs> but in, in policy domain, informality and illegality are conflated. And informality see, is seen as a bad thing, whereas we all know that informal sector is the first, you know, hope for the rural migrant who's coming out of the rural areas to to, uh, or the or agriculture sector to find a job or survive. So we can see that even if we conflict informality and illegality, here we, are, we can see that there is more than an enforcement problem. It's not just a law and order problem. It's not just that we have the laws, bring them in, enforce them. It's more than that, right? So I'll show you just the production in million tons in 20. 14 it's a bit old now. So, subsistence coal, actually, these are uh, based on my surveys. Eh? The subsistence coal, I, there's no data, of course. So, what I did is I stood, I took up one urban center because, they, because of the poor distribution system or strange distributory system of national coal. A, a town like Hazaribagh, for example, has four entries. I stood in all the four roads from around 5 o'clock in the morning till about 10 o'clock at night and counted how many cycles are coming in. So did that and then I extrapolated with the population, urban population. It's a very rough way, but that's the only way I can calculate. Okay, extrapolated with the urban population and then I took only the big, I mean there are lots of urban population, they are smaller towns and all that, I just calculated that. And I think about 15 tons of, million tons of uh, coal is transported by bullock carts and cycles and distributed in that area. <coughs> there is data on statecraft coal. 
five million tons and neoliberal coal and national coal as well. But we are also thinking about political economy. We also have to think who's producing it, not just the companies, but also people, right? And then we encounter a bigger problem. We, then we see that national coal, which is Coal India Limited, Coal India Limited is, has been subcontracting about 50% of its production. So you go to Coal India website, you see how many people are hired by Coal India, you get the data. How much coal is produced by Coal India Limited, you get the data. But what is not said is that the, uh, what is the amount of national coal here? 450 million, uh, 450,000 people who are shown in the HR records, there is another 200,000 and that is a very conservative estimate because people have told me that, that you know, 50% of all India's production is outsourced, contracted out. So local contractors, small you know, people, small businessmen, they take these contracts, they hire the jobs, you know, displace people locally, and then they work in this, you know, produce. So the coal, coal India's production, 520 billion tons of coal, is actually produced on a very basic calculation, not 450,000 people, but also there is the hidden. <coughs> 200,000, you know, inside that somewhere, nowhere mentioned, right? That's why I say that formal and informal binary thinking gets quite blurred in thinking about the four whole economies. If I think of the economy in this way, now neoliberal, uh, that is 60,000, I just did not do the calculation because it was so mind-boggling. And I, it needed me to go to each of these because the contractors' uh, habits and practices may vary. But I would say that another 20, 30,000 is hiding there as well because they also follow whole India's practice of some contracting out part of their production. Statecraft coal, we have an idea of how many people are involved from various surveys done by World Wildlife Fund and various other people. And for subsistence coal, which is you know illegal, just very broadly, yeah, illegal, non-legal, formal, informal, and neoliberal coal also formal. Yeah. Isn't there a overlap between illegal and informal coal because people who are involved in say, subsistence coal might be the ones who are also doing the jobs for like informal there could, be. there could be overlaps, there could be a lot more people than this. There could be your right. You know, this is really so you know there's a word there in English phrase there's a phrase you like to call a bundle of snakes where the head of the snake and the tail of the snake are together. I know it's like a tight bundle, we just don't know. It is a an economy that is massive in proportion. That's all right, we can say in terms of people involved, right? And it blurs all our understandings of how the economy should be, how you should, it should move, what it should do. It totally messes up with our uh, conventional understandings. So what I'm seeing is that, okay, how do people have been thinking, thinking about uh, all, uh, the economy in recent years? particularly where, form, where informal sector is a predominant part of the economy. And they have been thinking about, in a, in, there's a lot of literature coming out. And that's where I have borrowed, as, as I have seen, now I'm coming to the theory part, right? <laughs> so, they, 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 there's, there's some people who describe it as diverse economy. There's some people who call it the social economy. These other people who call it the human economy. I don't know, human economy, Keith Hart describes it as, as a human economy. I don't know whether I can want to call it human economy. And I don't want to be a judgmental, you know, give a label, good or bad. So I have avoided using human, I have, excuse me, I have also avoided using social economy because there's money involved, definitely. Poor people are into it. 
poor people, in a, in a Marxist view, poor people stay away from these materialistic values. So, moral person, right? Poor is equal to moral. You know, that was the uh, classical Marxist understanding of James Scott, for example, who talked about moral economy. But here we are seeing poor people, like the Khasis and Jantia, or the uh, Jharkhand indigenous people, are also engaging with the market. They are not refraining from the market. How do we describe that? How do we understand that? How do we explain that? So I, I, I call it diverse economy because now we in a post-Marxist situation, we are living in a world in which the market is an undeniable, undeniable reality and poor people are engaging with the market. They are being oppressed by the market, but they are also engaging with the market. They are taking the share of the market, making a moral claim, sometimes an immoral claim, but they are doing it anyway. So what I am saying here is that, okay, let's, we can think about the economy as organized by transactions, as labor, as enterprises, okay? And each of these have alternative components to the formal way of thinking, the national economy or the neoliberal, the two that are formal ones. And I have some tables, think about it. You know, it's, it's a very basic way of putting. So let's have a look at CIL. Right? CIL, the market is artificially protected, it's monopolized, it's the state regulated. CIL contractors, they are, they are taking advantage of that market. Exactly the same party. Although they belong to the informal sector, they are also artificially protected, monopolized, state regulated. Because they are, they are feeding into CIL. Captive coal, which is you know, neoliberal coal, captive coal yeah, is artificially protected because they are feeding into the power plants state regulated and they have a very niche market. They are not interacting with the rest of the market. They are not being allowed to by the Ministry of Coal. Right? So informal, which is known legal, which is statecraft, Meghalaya coal, market is naturally protected. They are going to Bangladesh. You go to select border of Bangladesh or go down south from Meghalaya to the Bangladesh border, you would see that government knows about it. There's a check post, people pay our tax across to go, the trucks go across the border to supply Bangladesh with the coal that is produced in Mehala. In informal, which is illegal, the subsistence type coal produced by indigenous people, the market is naturally protected. It's the niche market, niche industries, because there are lots of brick kilns coming up. Construction. In India, one of the booming sectors, industries of India is now construction industry. How will people get the brick? We produce brick in the traditional, using traditional technology. So the local brick kings and the local consumers, they all take the coal. So they have their niche market as well. We could find alternatives to each of these, but I won't go into that. Let me describe the labor for the sake of time. Sorry, it's all really what is like, yes? What exactly do you mean by protection there? This one naturally protected. Yeah, it's naturally protected means, protection means it's, it's sort of targeted. You know, there's the laws are such, the rules are such, the, the way the market operates it's, are such that it's protected. It cannot spread out. So, for example, Meghalaya cannot, coal cannot quickly come to Calcutta. It just goes there. That's the channel. That has been, you know, that is that is protection, not protection by an agency. Are you okay? But here we are seeing the labor. It's a very different now uh, picture coming. You, in the previous table, you would see that CIL and CIL, CIL contractors were exactly the same. So in here. We see totally a different situation between CIL and CIL contractor laborers because these are salaried people who are, you know, wages are sort of uh, dictated by trade unions or decided upon by argument, you know, enterprise bargaining with unionized <coughs> agencies. Whereas these are, wage, you know, locally paid poor people, you know, 150 rupees or 200 rupees per day often seasonal part-time manual workers. 
In Cactio also we are seeing the, you know, pretty much the same thing, but as I said, we should put another column here for informal, for the, for the, for the Cactio, uh, you know, contractors for the Cactio employees, and you would see this similar picture there. And in informal, non-legal, Vekaloi, <coughs> labor is non salary, no unionized, so labor situation is very similar to CIL uh, contractors, you know, so informal labor here and informal illegal is obviously entirely in, you know, sort of precarious labor. So look at the coal economy and think about the labor situation, labor that is in India's coal economy. How much of it is formal labor? Very small. Most people who are involved in this coal economy, that's why my arguments are not appreciated often by anti-mining lobby in India. Because I said that you're talking about a lot of people's lives, you can't just stop mining. You have to do something else, you know. You have to first go spend years, understand what the understand the belly of the get into the belly of the beast, understand the beast, what you're talking about, and then you can think about what you need to do. What is the ratio when you first uh, the columns? What is the ratio of formal to informal? Oh, in production, that's the interesting thing. Um, in production, Coal India Limited, uh, Coal India Limited has given out about 50% of its production to contractors. But I presume that these contractors do not have office. That's why I, if we, if you go back to that um, diagram, you would see that the amount I have is this the labor employed? Yeah, uh, I have. It's the, it should be at a, just the half of it, right? But it's not exactly the half of it because they, these people do not have offices, you know, they don't have a headquarters in Dalhousie Square in Calcutta where people sitting in air conditioned uh, comfort and making decisions, right? So just a uh, lot of wage based laborers, daily wage based laborers. So ratio would be ideally it would be 50 50, but a little less, you know. Uh, how would you com compare the private players to Poland in terms of the ratio? Formal to informal. Say that again, sorry? Private players. Yeah. That is so, I think, yeah. And the uh, coal India. What is the ratio of informal and formal over there? Yes, that's that, exactly. That's why I did not even go into that. I would need to go into their practices because they are private entrepreneurs, their practices would vary. That's why I haven't I haven't done that big. I have to go to each of their offices and find or fact their operations and find out how much of their work has been, uh, you know, subcontracted, and then see for myself what the nature of these operations are. I, I know that for sure for coal India, but I don't know, so I didn't go into that. But they are giving you a you know sort of idea about the uh, beast I'm talking about, huh? And then this is the labor, and I'll go to the transactions bit now. Enterprises, sorry. And <coughs> so how do we describe as a you know a, as management, you know people experts in management? So the capitalist enterprise, although it's state capitalism, people in India represents. You know, uh, recently the Economist came out with a cover story of state capitalism, and. The state capitalism exists in Indonesia's biggest uh, petroleum company or Brazil's company, Russia's Petrobras, uh, Indonesia's Pertamina. They are all they all represent. So, resource capital uh, nationalism is, in a sense, state capitalism, right? So there is no uh, no quarrel in there. <coughs> Capitalist enterprise, uh, CIL contractors, we know that. It's at the bottom, it's a capital, capitalist enterprise. At the top, it is a very semi-feudal process, you know, the local people hiring the sardars or contractors, tikedars, hiring laborers, you know, and putting them into wage labor and all that. So just see how in India, not only does the binary between formal and informal totally gets demolished, but also this idea of capitalist and non-capitalist enterprises because they are all mixed up in here. We can say, okay, captive coal is a new liberal coal, a capitalist enterprise, very simple. But when we look at Megaloa's coal the Khasi is often seriously 
Islam. They have the land. And somebody from Rajasthan or Delhi go with the cash. Say, can I mine with you 50-50? Right? Can I mine your land? So it's a strange situation. It's a capitalist individual entrepreneurial at the top of the production chain. But at the bottom again it is quite informal, semi-feudal type exploitative system, which has been written about quite a lot about Mingala's production system. In subsistence coal or illegal coal, we see a semi-feudal calm capitalist entrepreneurial enterprise. Is, I can say that these each of these families, you know, the husband and wife who were pushing the cycle with ladder with coal, they are semi-feudal, but they are also engaging with the market in a capitalist uh, uh, entrepreneurial mode. Right? So we we have this sort of picture. And then if you look at the rules that de determine each of these from you have, you might have seen that I have moved on to from economy I have moved on to words. So that's why I call it inverse words. You know, it's not just the four pole economies, right? It's sort of five or six pole words that are you know comprising of these a, you know, complex mix of formal and informal, legal and illegal and non-legal. So it's, it's a you know pathetic mix within that. And you will see that a lot of these laws that are ruling this sort of mining, some customary norms and values that are shared by the communities. Sometimes the, the woman that I, whose picture I didn't go into the detail, the woman whose picture I showed, she was raking the coal. She stood in a leasehold land and said, that, why would I not mine this land? It, it was mine. The Coal, coal India Limited took it. She had no paper, of course, for that land. That's why Coal India took it. But these sorts of norms and values are expressed by these communities. Here, we see a very strange situation. On the one hand, MMDR's mineral classification, which is major coal, cannot be cut by anybody else but the company or the state, but also Indian constitution. They are the two contradictory uh, you know, laws or uh, that are determining. The actors, I have said that according to the sixth schedule, it is the Gram Sabhas and the district councils that will make the decision. Right? So the Gram Sabhas have a very important role here. Here also the Gram uh, Panchayas, the Pradhans, they often know everything about what's going on in that area, who's digging, where they are digging, and they keep the mouth shut, generally. So this is the situation. So what we see as the coal economy is only the tip of the iceberg. The MOC sitting there in Delhi, the Coal India Limited High Headquarters in, in the House Square, but there's a lot more things happening here. Now I'll just quickly describe what I'm trying to say that, you know, coal, I am a geographer. We were told that coal, coal is a fossil fuel, you know, which was used to be organic material, got you know compressed by and you know other sediments, and for millions of years it turned into coal. It's a material you can burn it, and it has a high, you know, combustion uh, value or whatever. I have come to that point in life when I think that it is not the property of the material that is important. It is the quality of the material. You know, and that quality is very interesting. So, and that quality has been made not only by nature. We think that nature made it, made coal, but it was also humans. We have put an enormous amount of importance on coal in India and created that more than a material thing. You know, so we can see that coal has been co-constituted by nature and humans in India and created turn into a, what is what we describe as coal today. Value has been added by human labor. This up to here, it is called Marxist theory 101, as many of you would know. You know, Polanyi's theory, material, you know, surplus is being act, extracted from it and it is turned into commodity. But what happens after that? 
that's where the post-Marxist thinking assumes importance. After that, it's things <coughs> like value. It's things like morality. You know, that things that are not, that have not been conventionally counted in these theories. So this is a market-oriented thesis that explains the commodification of coal. But it doesn't explain the four coal economies or five or six coal worlds that have come into existence in India. And that's why I think that the interaction of that material with the human society and the political spaces, the social spaces that Paul <coughs> is traversing in this journey. And then on the end of it, which I have, could not, did not have space to write, that is, that is becoming very important. That's where people's thoughts about coal, the values about coal, how we think about national development, and, and, and how we think about indigenous people and their rights. Why would an indigenous person in Meghalaya would have more rights than the person who's in Jharkhand? Really, that's where the, that's where the five whole worlds or six whole worlds inhabit. So, yeah, I think this is the simplistic binary I have talked about, and and we really need to move on to from there. And that can only be done through thorough empirical research, lots of legwork, I'm sorry, but no official statistical data would give you the kind of picture that I have tried to draw for you here. And how then we, this is an afterthought I have added, how then shall we think about resource governance? Because we think about resource governance as you know, so okay, there are the laws and policies, right? And we 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 are sort of controlling this formal, uh, you know, in, uh, CIM and captain. But we also need to think about informal legal contractors. They are operating in a legal way. These contractors with CIM or with uh, privately owned plants. But then there are also informal <coughs> non-legal operators and informal illegal operators. When we think about informal resource governance, we need to take into consideration this whole gamut of things that are in there and the policies and laws should respond to their needs and their uh, interests. So this is just basically I'm trying to sum up in India when you go through the literature about, about mining, literature on mining or literature on coal, you would see that they, they, no one has a lot of good praise, you know, good words about mining. The need for coal is almost always framed in terms of energy security, that India needs energy security and that's why we need coal. That's, that's feeling. And that's why scholars like Randera talk about India as a cunning state. You know, that's okay how we are framing the debate in terms of energy security. We are not looking at the distributional aspects of course, so that's the point there. And then we have talked about how India has been indulging in predatory growth or vulture capitalism and, 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 and also, you know, which is taken from David Harvey's idea of capital bondage. So, when I adopt an oral, uh, alternative framework in interpreting Coal mining. Then I see that the whole idea of moral economy of is just not entirely applicable in context of India's coal mining industry, lock, stock, and barrel. Because there's more happening there. How do I then put Meghalaya coal? Okay, I use the moral framework in a, in, a, in explaining Jharkhand's subsistence coal, but I can't then take it and implant it in Meghalaya because there's more happening there. So that's that's the reason. Why I also feel that uh, there is a preoccupation with law and order as well. And so these are the critiques that we almost always talk about. Uh, you know, the uh, citizen is a legal subject. Everything should be subject to law and order. Mm, and this is a critique by Komarov and Komarov in context of South Africa, actually. And then basically, what come back to what Benjamin's thinking about 
the violence of law, the, and how the poor are experiencing lawmaking and law preserving violence, you know, and, and that is applicable in thinking about subsistence goal, thinking about uh, the contractors, neighbors who are operating, who are working for CIL and captive police uh, operations. So, how then do we think? J.K. Gibson Graham is the joint pen name of uh, two human geographers, Julie Graham and Kathleen Gibson. And I had the good opportunity to work with Kathleen Gibson in ANU. And they talk about uh, the diverse economy, which I find a very useful framework. And they say that when we talk about the economy, we see only the tip of the iceberg. This, this quote is from their 2006 book, which is named the post-capitalist politics. And that's what I was trying to say, that we think about capital, but capital just fails to explain everything after a point. Then we have to think beyond capital. And how do we think about those things, the, the, the various things that are going on in the economy? And that, that can be explained by the framework that they have proposed that, you know, we need to probably step away from thinking about capital all the time and move on to look at the various things, the diversities that are contained in economy. They talk a lot about, for example, the gift economy, the moral economy, the slave labor economy, the bonded labor economy. And all this comprise, and they say that what we see is a very interesting diagram. If you Google J.K. Gibson Graham, Diverse Economy Framework, and you would see that they explain their economy with the iceberg, you know, and the tip of the iceberg, the visible part of the economy, is the economy that we see, the formal CIL or the captive, you know, in my case, CIL or the captive uh, whole economies. And below that is that whole lot of things that I described, you know, formal, informal labor, legal, illegal, tussles, and all that. So, so that's where I would end. Thank you for listening. So, like, when we talk of all the four economies of, say, coal, uh, somewhere, if it is a market-driven profit, would be a common element in all four of it, you can say. But now, with this current discourse on, say, climate change or public health, now the common denominator is like the negative externalities that are coming out of coal. So all all coal is bad. So state coal is bad as well as the subsistence coal is bad. So in, in this scenario, then like how how this like whatever you are describing as four different aspects of it. Uh, right now, because we are now trying to replace coal in the household, uh, say a cook stove, as well as we are trying to clean that. Uh, mm -hmm. In, in the state run, say, coal power plant. So, what, what do you think, like, where are we going in, in, in that sense? Because in case of profits, we could clearly say that, okay, the poor are not getting as much as the rich are getting. But yeah. in, a, in, in an environmental public health kind of a scenario, we are kind of trying to level the field for all these four things. By saying that, okay, it is bad for the environment, it is bad for public health, so it should be banned for everybody. Very good question. I'll tell you what. The answer would have two aspects to it. One is a theoretical component. The other one is a more practical component. So what you're saying is, so what about this elephant in the room? The environment. Mm -hmm. How much How much longer can we keep pampering this uh, coal mm -hmm. and have the coal addiction that we have in India and not think about other things? The theoretical part I will give, and then I will go to the technical or more practical answer. See, the, the question is, uh, what you are saying is rooted in, again, a moral economy, moralistic, I would say, framework. So, long time ago when James Scott came out with his weapons of the weak and the moral economy concept in context of Southeast Asia, another scholar, you know, his name was Hopkins, I think, yeah. Popkin, wasn't it? He, he worked in Vietnam also uh, and he said, he showed that the moral peasants, the, the portrayal of the peasants almost always as moral is in 
for it because the peasants also engage with the market. And so they are not outside, outside of the commodified, commodification system or commodification process. They are not outside and they don't reject the market in a Marxian sense all the time. And that has remained, become the famous Scott versus Popkin debate in thinking about all these peasant resistance or alternative social movements, whatever. So that is, let's think about the peasant then as a moral and then see where is the morality now coming from. In thinking about the environment, in the, the damages that coal causes to the environment, there is a morality there, right? And that morality is now being exposed, expressed by first the first wall, and then also the the first wall that exists within India. People who are sitting there in Delhi, you know, air conditioned comfort, you know, using the lift, and uh, you know, space heating for win in winter cold, and you know, and and cooling for for summer warmth. They are expressing that very, but. That morality has no uh, legitimacy to the people who are at the bottom. That is why India is unable to take a moral stance, you know, and say that no, we reject coal. It, it cannot. There is the Ministry of Coal that runs this everything, you know, this big formal economy with you know, 450,000 laborers, and and it knows that. Don't ever think that I am the first person who has who's saying this to. And if I have written about it, I'm sure somebody in Coal India has read. They are not stupid and silly people as we would like to think. Huh? So they know that this huge, diverse economy that is like a sluggish beast lagging behind them. Hmm? They are very much aware of that. That's why they cannot just stop it. They cannot just change it all, you know, all of a sudden. They know that it will destroy ordinary people. It will kill thousands of people who are dependent on coal in India. And that's why the claims put forth by the activists also sound shallow. <laughs> that's why they have not been able to make a dent. If there was genuineness, they would have made a dent. Because we have very good activists in India who have changed situations, right? But why in case of coal that has not happened? That has not happened because of this uh, huge moral question. You cannot bring, the, bring environmental morality in thinking about coal. I mean, we have been thinking coal since 1774. We have an entire region in Eastern India. If you, if you just travel from Durgapur westwards to Bokaro, Jharkhand, Ranchi, Hazaribar, mile after mile of area, it is socially it has been transformed. The landscape has been transformed. And that's happening today in Mahanadi coal field area, that's happening in Bas Bastar I, or Chhattisgarh area. I can't say that that's doing good to the, I'm not saying that. And that's not my perspective. That's not helping the poor. This, but that is, but people who are claiming that we should shut the coal down, put a moratorium on all coal mining, they are also not helping the coal. That's because of this, you know, ball of snakes that we have created over layers of law, layers of situation, formal, informal complexity, you know, and this subcontracting and all that. It's, it's, it, and that's why it's very difficult to provide a policy prescription. You know, we can't just Hey, this is the capsule here. Take it and swallow it, and you will solve the problems. I can't do that. Nobody else can do that. This is the problem. I think we need a totally fresh rethinking about coal in India. And I don't know when that will happen or who will do it. You know that because that means breaking down a ministry. You know that, that means looking at not just the Land Acquisition Act, but laws like. MMDR, MCR, which are, which are determined by many geologists and engineers who have not had, uh, had so far the kind of social understanding or political understanding or policy understanding even. So 
that will take some time. But it will come. I'm hopeful that it will come. You know, at some stage. That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, one problem is in Pondicota River, there are other uh, 
issues involved. One is environment, the other one is health and safety. In mining, health and safety is a big, I mean, the whole idea of nationalism, nationalization, you know, that in, in, I have gone through the parliamentary debates in 1960s. Kumar Mangalam sitting there, standing there in the parliament, talking about how our coal mines were death pits. And that's when coal mines were nationalized in 1972, 1973, because they wanted to protect the workers. So entire labor safety issue is there. I cannot just say that small is beautiful because it's, it is also difficult to control the small uh, enterprises. You know, enormously difficult. So we, I think that's what I was trying to say in response to him, that we need different mechanisms of governance, not just that centralized Ministry of Coal, but very decentralized. They, when was the last time a Panchayat person was brought into Delhi and taught the value of the environment? Has there been any programs like that ever that he knows, that Panchayat Pradhan knows what to do? Where are the what he knows that they have to tick these boxes that one that much he knows forest click and, and all that but he doesn't know what is the value of the environment why he should preserve it how he should what power does he have to control and manage and supervise the operations of a small body so these are things that need to be considered I think when we move when this we, when we understand the diverse economy within which coal exists or diverse economy of coal in India, then we think about diverse management practices and that's where we need to think. So first we need to get Ministry of Rural Development to sit with Ministry of Coal to converse, get Ministry of Coal to, you know, uh, you know so disperse a lot of its practices and, and powers, uh, you know, and and they also train the community leaders to be able to stand up and you know talk to these quality owners uh, to be able to control them. Okay, on that note, I think we we will stop the discussions here, Thank and uh, that's also to prepare for uh, continuing the conversation afterwards. So thank you very much, Kunta, uh, for giving us this uh, really interesting presentation, uh, demonstrating. Um, how complex and difficult some of these uh, regulatory challenges in the Indian context can be, and therefore also how uh, difficult it is to really sort of what is required in terms of uh, designing public policy for the Indian business. You know, in economics, uh, we have sort of uh, simple math mathematical models of extraction of non renewable natural resources, and you sort of you can uh, you need a few parameters and you sort of derive sort of policy for doing that mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't take you very far of course as we've seen here. So of course part of the idea of the JSW Public Policy School is also um, to emphasize exactly this point that uh, public policy challenges in India are often extremely complicated. It's, it's not only when it comes to coal uh, or the alternatives that you mentioned which I think are very useful. Um, it applies to the management of many of the large programs that are running here. And the idea in this school, one of the ideas that we are discussing in the school is of course that we um, need to think about new analytical approaches for understanding these issues um, and, and uh, think hard about that uh, with a view to then um, strengthen what is being done at the moment. We, we see far too many RCTs doing sort of small cuts of the overall king and telling you maybe a little bit about a tweak here and a tweak there, uh, but understanding what has to be done um, in a larger scale uh, is, is really sort of uh, uh, large things. So on that note, I think you know this is, is a very timely reminder about uh, the importance of Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Sure. It's great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you.